When veterans pull together, they become a powerful force for change. Of all the causes that veterans advance, perhaps one of the most important is saving the environment for future generations. Stay with us tonight as we discuss veterans and the environment. Thanks for tuning in to Veterans Voices. I'm your host, Stephen Burchick. Tonight, we will be talking with veterans who are helping the environment. If you wanna be part of the conversation, call us at 925-313-1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One, or email us at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. For those watching live tonight, we could really use your calls and emails to let us know who is tuning into the show. I want to introduce tonight's guest, retired Brigadier General Eric Peck of the Save Farm, Nancy Lobby, Director, North American Grazing Lands Strategy of the Nature Conservancy, Jack Daly with the Washington Veteran Conservation Corps, and Vince Dijanich, of Veterans for Peace. Welcome. We'd like each of you to do a brief introduction, uh, give us a little bit of background uh, about your military service and uh, your current projects. Uh, tell you what, Jake, why don't you go first? I'm Jake Daly. Uh, I live in Olympia, Washington, and uh, I am currently an intern with the Veterans Conservation Corps. Uh, we do, I'm currently doing uh, wildlife monitoring for Conservation Northwest, an organization here in Washington that uh, helps get wildlife crossings built um, right. to, to do uh, reconnect, reconnect wildlife, um, wildlife populations here in the Northwest. And I also uh, am part of an organization called Veterans Ecological Trades Collective. And I have a regenerative agroforestry startup um, that's US Rake Force, so. Uh, okay, okay, sounds, sounds like, like you have a lot going on. By the way, we have a couple of photos. Uh, we're gonna pop them on the screen. If you can uh, briefly describe uh, what it is we're looking at. Um, so, I guess I'm in the middle. No, I'm on the left in the picture of uh, the three soldiers on the Humvee. Uh, that was that was my truck. I was a medic. Um, and then Tito Ortiz came to our camp um, for uh, a visit, and I got to get a fight pose with him. So that was pretty cool. And then uh, this is me in the wild now. Um, I do hazardous, uh, hazardous fuels reduction to, uh, try to mitigate catastrophic wildfires out West here. Um, and the biomass that I collect, we turn into regenerative, uh, regenerative soil amendments, um, to try to regenerate our, our degraded landscapes. Well, thank you very much. If we can go to Eric. And Eric, if you can describe uh, military background and uh, current projects. And I think we have a photo or two for you as well. Okay, I have about 40 years in the military. Most of the time I was an aviator flying helicopters and airplanes. And then they kicked me upstairs and I started dealing with people problems and logistics. That was my military career in a nutshell. One deployment to Afghanistan. Uh, now I'm working with SAVE, which is a service member agricultural vocational uh, training uh, farm in in or near Manhattan, Kansas, and we train veterans and transitioning service members in agricultural careers, focusing on sustainable farming. Okay, and there's a couple of photos. Well, it's uh, me at Kop Najil up in the mountains in Afghanistan, where we were uh, meeting with several local farmers. Uh, one of them wanted to trade his wife for a uh, hand powered rototiller. 
So <laughs> kind, of, kind of a funny story about that. We wouldn't do it, but because uh, he couldn't sustain it. But the other one is uh, <laughs> another one is uh, a meeting with village elders, talking to them about agricultural projects that we wanted to do with them, and negotiating what what and how we could do them. And then the final one, we'd been to that village in the background, talking the same thing with that village, uh, how to do agricultural products and uh, trying to replace opium production. This one is uh, at the safe farm building a hoop house. One of the things I teach out there is construction and uh, we put up a hoop house, very proud of that hoop house. It's withstood uh, several hundred mile an hour windstorms and still standing and still got the plastic on it. Well, thank, well, thank you, you very much. much. Nancy, Nancy, give us a little of your background. Sure, so I'm originally from Nebraska and um, we grew up on a ranch here. Uh, really small town. And so right out of high school, I joined the army and spent eight years in the military as a counterintelligence agent, traveled all over the world, spent most of my career overseas um, in Korea and uh, all over Europe. Um, now I work for the Nature Conservancy and my role here at the Nature Conservancy is to work on our sustainable grazing program. We work on grazing lands across North America, really working with uh, ranchers with um, supply chain actors. So think about um, those that are producing beef and uh, try to identify ways that we can help them be more successful because if they're successful, then they are doing positive things for the environment. Well, thank you. And here's a couple of images. Yeah, that's me literally coming right off of the ranch to uh, <laughs> into um, the military. I was in during, I actually served at Forces Command under Brigadier, under General Colin Powell. And um, at the time that I was getting promoted, we were in the skiff and we were uh, kind of under lockdown. And so I actually got promoted with vir virtually nobody there. So yeah, it was quite a quite an experience. Okay, and the horse photo? Yeah, I um, so a lot of my work with with um, the grazing land uh, folks, I I get to basically take what I learned as a as a rancher and what I've learned in the beef industry and um, apply that to the environment and how we can actually improve the environment. So that's just representative of some of the work that I do. I, I get to jump on a horse sometimes and ride ride on the ranch and rope cattle and do stuff that I normally would do on the ranch, and I get to do that as part of my work with. The Nature Conservancy. Well, that sounds, sounds great. great. Vince, Vince, tell, tell us, us a little bit about, about yourself. Hi, I'm, I'm Vince Dionich, and I currently live in Oakland, California. Um, I'm that rare thing. I'm a native San Franciscan. I was born in San Francisco, uh, raised in the Central Valley. And uh, I, went in, I went into the Army. I didn't want to work. I didn't want to go to school. And I was looking for an adventure. And I found much more adventure than I wanted. I wound up being in the infantry with 101st Airborne, um, mostly in Northern I Corps, which is now what would be considered Central Vietnam. And uh, then I, I got out of the Army and uh, I became a climate activist, among other things, at the time. And currently, I, I'm a member of Veterans for Peace and one of the founding members of the climate crisis and militarism project. And our main goal is to look at, um, look at and educate people about the, the fossil fuel use and emissions of the military. And we're also beginning to look at the fossil fuel emissions and use in the actual war. Um, looking at the Ukraine now, we're, we're finally starting to get some numbers so that we can actually put something together. Okay, okay, and your photo there, there, can you describe uh, that image? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was in the um, Ashaw Valley, and that area had been bombed and strafed uh, heavily by artillery, and that helicopter on its side was shot down, and we just moved in and started setting up mortar pits. And so I took, I took that picture. Um, that was uh, that was quite a thing. That that whole picture, yeah. So sure we looks like it. Yeah. And, and this, this one? one? Uh, this one is with a couple of my other friends from Veterans for Peace. One 
the, t the other man is Steve Morris, who was originally going to be on this program, but he's in rural Pennsylvania without internet at this time, visiting family. So I, I, I stepped up and the other woman is Judith, who's a member of Veterans for Peace as an associate member. And that's at a, a climate rally in San Francisco, but right before COVID. Okay. okay. Before uh, we moved into Masklandia. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, here's a question for each of you, or just kind of throw it out there. What do you consider to be uh, the most important environmental issue or issues of today? Uh, does somebody raise a hand? Okay, Nancy. Well, I mean, I think we're hearing about it even from folks on this panel. Climate is like at the top of everybody's mind and everybody's trying to figure out how they can they can make an impact. And so I think, you know, I, I, I didn't come into, uh, you, you know, I didn't leave high school and decide, you know what, I'm going to join the army and then I'm going to work for the Nature Conservancy. I mean, that never crossed my mind, but the path that I kind of took sort of led me to really being able to contribute into that climate conversation, knowing that the work that I'm doing on the ground with ranchers and with farmers is actually going to make a positive impact on the climate. You know, natural climate solutions is a real, it's a real thing that we're working on at the Nature Conservancy and really feel like it's something that we can, we can do to make an impact. Okay. okay. I think, I think uh, uh, Vince, Vince had his hand up. Well, I, I would agree that uh, it's a, it, we're having a climate emergency and a climate crisis. And um, it's like we're on this big ship in the middle of the ocean and we, we have to turn it around fairly quickly, um, do 180. And I, I think um, it's very urgent. And anything anybody wants to do, any organization that anybody wants to work with is just fine. I, I do several myself from the Sierra Club to Veterans for Peace to the Climate Reality Project. Um, so in any any work that you want to do, you know, in the urban areas or rural or in the suburbs, it's all good work. Okay. okay. And, and uh, the, Eric, uh, what do you view as the, the most important well, or a couple of the most important issues? Well, the, the most important, of course, is the focus on climate change and all the impacts it has on people and how we can mitigate that. Uh, we, we keep kicking the can down the road and we've kicked it as far as we could kick it. And we're going to have to do something other than kick the can down the road now. So it takes uh, a little bit of input from everybody to, to resolve this. It's not just about some of us doing something. It's about everybody doing something to reduce the, the footprint that we have, uh, primarily from petrochemical use, but al also some other things. But uh, that's, that's really where I see the focus having to be over the next 50 to 100 years is how to reduce that. And, and the, the balance is with the population we have in the world, how to continue to feed people at a rate that they don't starve to death or we don't have uh, massive outbreaks of, of some kind of disease from the, the, the issues we're creating. I'm, I'm that seems seeing to be a common, common thread here where uh, protecting the land, food production, and changing climate are, are very much interrelated. Uh, Jake, uh, give us your perspective on that. I'm, I'm going to agree. Um, Everyone, everyone touched on it. Climate change, uh, it's, it's not, the world's not going to end. Um, people are going to go extinct. We're currently going through the, the sixth mass extinction on this planet in its history. And we're, we're causing it. And if we don't want to go extinct, we have to change our behavior. And uh, turning, turning our actions into regenerating um, our environment rather than degrading it. Um, we were in the military. Uh, we know how destructive the military is. Um, and we know the problems that, that veterans have 
when they get out. Mm -hmm. And this work that, that we do to regenerate our environment is regenerative to us. Um, it's regenerative to our souls because we contributed to the destructive nature of the military and um, that causes a problem. So when we contribute to the, the restorative restoration ecology, um, that's restorative to ourselves, right? Um, and that's, uh, that's my life. Um, I contributed to, I contributed to destruction and now I'll, I'll contribute to restoration. You use the term regenerative. Could, could you briefly describe what you mean by that? Well, regenerative is taking something degraded and restoring it, um, regenerating life, right? So like um, we've tilled and we've uh, sprayed petrochemicals and we've mismanaged our forests. Um, and these are, are causing massive problems, but I have a, a mindset of the problem being the solution. Um, so we turn the excess fuels into regenerative soil products. And um, I feel good about that, right? So um, I hope that answers your question. It, it, it does. does. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. And if I can I just add on to that, Steve, sure. I, think, I think that, you know, I think that's a the whole the whole regenerative cycle is really about, you know, making sure that nature works as it's supposed to work. Right. It's about taking what taking sunlight and, and making sure that plants can utilize that sun, sunlight and then it works on the microbes in the soil. And then, you know, we have things that eat those plants and then it, it it's about that. It's about that cycle. And the things that we're talking about, you know, I said climate is, you know, obviously at the top of everybody's mind, but one of the things to keep in mind is the things that we're doing for, for climate also have impacts bigger than just the climate, right? Like biodiversity impacts. We're, we're creating more um, space for wildlife. We're creating better water quality, better um, water infiltration. But I mean, all of these things all work together, better livelihoods for farmers and ranchers or, or whatever, or marine biologists or, or, you know, fisheries or whatever the case may be. Like we're, the things that you do for climate also have impacts elsewhere. And so while climate is kind of the thing that people have their blinders on right now and going, yes, it's all about the climate, it has impacts. There's there's other other aspects aspects to it. To it. Well, thank you. We're reaching the end of this segment. We will come back shortly. When we come back, uh, we're going to continue the conversation with our panel. Right now, let's take a look at what other veterans had to say when I asked them about helping the environment in this month's A Vet on the Street segment. We're gathered at the Veterans Memorial Building in Danville, where a lot of veterans are watching the Army-Navy game. I'll admit I'm a little biased, uh, go Army, but we'll see how the game turns out. Our question today is, how can veterans help the environment? Hi, this is Mark Heineman, U.S. Army Reserve. And the way I think the veterans that I work with and enjoy and the company of is uh, every day we have to make decisions about what we're doing. And an example that where we can help the environment is rather than just making a run down to Safeway and then back home and then a run later in the day to the post office and back home, try to combine multiple stops so it's actually one trip and that will help save obviously on greenhouse gases and can make a better environment, not only for our fellow veterans, but for our children and grandchildren. 
Hi, I'm Pat Leary, U.S. Army. Um, that's the most interesting question. There's lots of great causes. There's uh, solar systems, there's uh, electric cars, there's all kinds of uh, campaigns out there. But I find personal example uh, in my daily life, something that I can really do. When I go for a walk downtown or just for my casual daily exercise, I pick up stuff. So uh, toss it in the trash. So that's my, that's my effort. Well, hi, I'm Michelle Lee, and I'm with um, retired from the United States Air Force. And I think uh, veterans can help the environment in small personal ways. Um, for example, I just came from an event where they um, have a lot of recycled cans that they're just throwing into the trash, and I'm planning to go get those cans and take them in to be recycled. I think um, helping the environment is picking up litter that's not your own. I think that's really important. A lot of things I do is very much on a personal level, uh, but I also think it's important to look at whether you can look at energy savings and all of the electronics and uh, vehicles and appliances that we purchase and, and always get energy saving devices. Uh, my name is John Robbins. I was in the United States Army from 1966 to 1969. Uh, to help the environment, uh, everybody should be a good steward and uh, watch what they do individually. We need to raise good people that do good things. Hi, I'm Mike Mundell. Um, I am a U.S. Army officer. Uh, uh, I still serve in the Army Reserves. Um, how can veterans help the environment? You know, one of the things the military has always taught me is to leave a place better than you found it. So, you know, when you start thinking of the environment, it's every day that many of us kind of walk past uh, trash, garbage, just anything on the side of the road that that people leave behind, good, bad, and different. There's an opportunity to just improve the community that you live in, the space you live around, just by cleaning up after others. That's probably the simplest way we could all help the environment. Uh, Dennis Giacovelli, uh, United States Navy. Uh, I actually am still working. I uh, have a design business. Uh, so I'm uh, very uh, cognizant of what is required and, and what we should do uh, to help the environment and also uh, make your life a little easier and better. Uh, adding a little more insulation uh, makes it quieter, makes it uh, hotter, makes it cooler in winter, in summer, hotter in the winter. Um, energy efficient lighting, you never have to replace the, the light bulbs. That's good for us old guys. We don't stand on ladders. Um, use less water. The, the, the new faucets uh, uh, don't allow you to use the water we used to. Um, just in general, it, it, it's a win-win. It makes your house feel better and also better for the environment. Michael Slattengren, United States uh, Navy veteran. Um, veterans can help out the environment uh, just as well as any other uh, civilian can, and that is to recycle items uh, from our own garbage from our household uh, and for business, for anybody that's still working. Uh, they can volunteer to work in uh, or uh, help out in uh, beaches, uh, on trails, out in the environment, uh, and uh, make life better for our children and grandchildren so that they have a, a good earth to inherit from us. Well, the game is over and I'm happy to report that Army won this year. Go Army. <laughs> now let's hear from some veterans at a different location. I mean, as, as veterans goes and, and, and as far as a, a war situation or something goes, you tear up a lot of stuff, man. So <laughs> you tear up a lot of stuff, you destroy a lot of stuff, you burn a lot of stuff, you kill a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah, the environment is important. You know, when you're in, in your unit, you just, besides police calling, you know, around your building and cleaning up, that's, that's the most we do for our environment, I believe. So we sign up for serve as a country. That's why we're fighting for. If something wrong in this country, I think we we should, you know, take a step forward to tell what is wrong. What the one thing the military, the army, tell me is gotta be do the right thing. And if the environment sometimes stepping wrong, go to the wrong direction, 
we should we should step forward to tell what's going on. We're talking with veterans about the environment. Want to be part of the conversation? Call us at 925-313-1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One or email us at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. For those watching live tonight, we could really use your calls and emails to let us know who is tuning into the show. Now we're gonna to return to our panel. Uh, and we've seen some interesting comments. I heard some interesting comments from a number of other veterans as well. I'd be interested in your thoughts on uh, how can veterans support uh, environmental issues. Uh, what would you recommend that uh, that folks do? Hey, hey uh, I was thinking on the last uh, uh, as we ended the last segment. Uh, we talk a lot about the big picture, the big uh, the environment and the climate change. And what we need to focus on is the little individual pieces, because the little individual pieces doing each one of those, somebody doing one or two of those is what builds up to solve the big climate change piece. So when people get overwhelmed and they talk about climate change, they think of it as some big thing that the, they can't attack. And that's what we need to convince people they can attack it and how they can attack it, what little things they can do every day. Several of the folks that talked in, in between talked about it. How can you save water? How can you use less water? Because every time we use water, that, that's all produced for us and it has to be filtered and cleaned and that sort of thing. And then every time it goes down the drain, it goes back into the cycle, but we still have to cycle it back. So how do we use less water in everything that we do? And it doesn't matter whether it's at your house, whether it's me on the farm or somebody on a ranch or in a industrial production, how do we reduce that use of water? And that's particularly coming to, to fruition as we look at the drought in the Western United States. How are we going to <laughs> alleviate that a little bit, right? Absolutely. It's, it's like spokes on a wheel, right? We all, we all play a role. It's, it's a cycle. It's the carbon cycle, right? Yes. And there mm -hmm. are many spokes in the carbon cycle. Um, and I remember in basic training, the, the last guy, the last guy on the video, um, he, he said, we're veterans. We, we need to do it. I remember in basic training, uh, a drill sergeant, um, always saying, don't worry, privates we'll fix it. And it was not fun after, after he said that, but, um, <laughs> so the work is going to be hard. So we've we've done a good job messing up the planet. So we need to lead the way. I think okay. that there's simple things that people can do, right? I mean, I think you heard a lot of people say recycle, recycle. I mean, that's one thing. The one thing we find is, by gosh, waste less food because that food that you're throwing in the trash can, whether it's from a restaurant or from the grocery store or something you cooked, it has resources to it. It 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 was it costs water. It not only costs money, it costs water. It costs you know carbon, it costs lots of things, biodiversity pieces to that. So if there's one thing I could tell people is don't waste food, eat, you know, as, as much as you can, if you could waste less food, if we would waste about, if we would cut our waste in half, we'd be way further towards our climate goals than we are right now, just by cutting our food waste in half. I, to, to do that. I agree with that. I, I, I was listening to those speakers and I'm thinking, you know, I do, I do all those things and that's great. And, and I, I, I do a lot more as well. I, um, I think we can learn a lot from the indigenous people, the people that are still, you know, that still live on the land and the Iroquois, for example, you know, had in their confederation before Europeans came to the continent, they, when they thought about making decisions about the environment, they thought about what's the effect of this going to be on the next seven generations? You know, and we, we, one of the things I think we can do besides being personal, doing the personal stuff is figure out how to take a longer term view of things. Um, and like I said, 
any organization that's doing climate or environmental work that you want to work with that floats your boat, you know, there's plenty of them out there. Um, you may not like mine, that's fine. You may like somebody else's, that's great. But it's, you know, it, it's, it's, I think, I think getting, getting involved and doing something beyond that personal stuff, which I, I do all that stuff, drive an electric car, have solar panels, you know, you, you know, monitor, have governors on the water and everything. Um, but I mean, if everybody did that, that would help, but it still, it still wouldn't mitigate the, you know, the bigger, the bigger issue. So I think, I think there's a tandem approach working on the smaller stuff and looking at, looking at a shift in the way that we view, the way that we view stuff. Because I'm, you know, I, I grew up as you as you you throw it out. Like I don't throw food out. It either it either goes in green waste, which gets recycled in mulch and fertilizer, or it goes into compost. You know, there's 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 those you can everybody can make those kinds of choices. I, I know in some municipalities they don't have green waste, which is you know, which I think is is a good project to lean on your city or your county. You know, why don't we have this? Or they some places don't have recycling. Why don't we have this? Well, I'm, well, I'm sure, sure a lot of people are working, working toward, toward getting, getting, getting some of those. those. I'm just I'm, thinking back to uh, comments from grandparents during the 30s growing up in the Depression. And I'd be interested in the statistic on how much food was purchased per person uh, in the 1930s in the midst of the Depression and how much food is purchased now, either in pounds or uh, volume? Uh, I'm, I'm sure the numbers are higher now, and people may be a little more uh, casual about it. Well, oh, they're way higher than they were even in the 1950s. You know, all you got to do is stand in a super line, a, a supermarket line, or a Costco line and watch, and you can. You, and it's not that hard to figure out. But I know in the 30s, my mother told me stories about the depression where they did not have much and they didn't waste anything. And I think that all shifted in this country after World War II. Well, yeah. we seem to have gotten better in terms of food production, uh, yields per acre. Uh, once again, I'm talking to the choir here, but yields per acre have, have skyrocketed, but there are probably some limits on uh, you know, what we can make. And there obviously is a cost. There've been a couple of references to soil and to water. Uh, and I'm sure there's a couple experts here. Uh, what are a couple of the things can be done uh, to to get more efficient with soils or protect them? I'm going to jump in here and say, uh, stop tilling. We're we're destroying an ecosystem under our feet. We can't see it, um, so we don't think about it. Um, but the soil is the skin of, of the earth. And every time we till, we're, we're destroying um, that ecosystem. There's life in the soil. Um, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree, uh, no waste, no food waste. Um, all of our food comes from the ground. So all of our food should go back to the ground. Um, it's a cycle. If we, if we just start thinking about reconnecting um, things that we've disconnected, like um, our food waste should not be going to the landfill. It should be going back to farmers' fields so that they can, they can grow the next crop. Okay, um, I'd like to hear from Nancy. You're with Nature Conservancy. Uh, what are your views on soil protection, regeneration, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, Jake brought up a really good point. The other thing that I think we can we can do is to keep the soil covered and to, and to keep something growing on it. Um, one of the things that we look at at the Nature Conservancy and the work that we do is on grazing lands, especially is you got to keep you got to keep that grass growing, because if you keep that grass growing, not only are you gathering sunlight and, and photosynthesis happens and you're creating all that um, um, carbon that feeds all that underground livestock, we call it un, in, under the soil, but you're also creating a system where it basically 
you're capturing more water, you're you are providing, you know, habitat for for birds and for other wildlife. And you're also creating a better livelihood for the people that are growing that grass. So the better the, the soil, the better the grass, the more water you collect, the better it is for wildlife. There, there's a uh, we're in cat where the show is based out of California. And there are a number of companies in the in the Bay Area here that are working on producing food uh, out of uh, veg vegetables or, or green uh, products that mimic uh, beef and other foods. You're in an area with grazing, et cetera. How do you reconcile the two or uh, how do the farmers feel about that? Well, farmers don't love it. I can tell you that. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's trying to to do something that um, I mean, my parents don't love it. They're, we're we're ranchers, and um, you know, we we just soon eat the beef. What I would say on grazing lands is, you know, all, all of these things. It's there's no silver bullet, right? I mean, okay, it's great. Some people don't want to eat beef, and that's fine. So so have that. Just know that there's an environmental impact to those foods as well mm -hmm. for grazing lands. Our grazing lands must be grazed. And so it requires an animal to graze that, whether it's a bison or a cow or sheep or something with, with cloven hooves that they can graze that, that land and, and consume that grass. If you don't graze it, it actually becomes degraded as Jake was saying earlier, it's, it's not good. And so while those, those products are, are great for the people that choose to eat those things, um, we still need animals on the grazing lands in order to keep Grazing, grazing lands healthy. Eric, any uh, comments or thoughts from you and and the Save Farm group? <laughs> sure, that that, uh, that goes back to the uh, all the things that we talked about with the the cycle of life. You know, what, that's what we're talking about here is how do you do it? And just like uh, Nancy was saying about grazing lands, we don't want to till those grazing lands and raise crops on them. That's that's the wrong thing to do with them. You, you need to use the land the way it's set up to be used. And, and that's part of what we talk about when we teach in the, at the Save Farm is what is the, the basic nature of the land that you're going to farm and what can you and what can you not do with that land. And a lot of the things we talk about uh, with the soil quality, soil quality and water conservation are if you're going to till it, is how do you contour farm and those kind of things. And the, the idea of not tilling is, is what we push, but if you can't not till, there's some areas that you can't do that on. You have to till a little bit, but we go to minimal till. So what we're trying to do is, is adapt to the situation that you have, and you have to be able to analyze what the nature of the soil and the, and the, the other things that go into it. When you talk about no-till, one of the things that we have a hard time convincing folks that have been farming for years on is how you get to no-till because it takes five to seven years to build up what Jake was talking about, that microbe, oh. microbe set that, that really helps you produce the way we are producing now with the addition of petrochemicals. But convincing folks to do that is the tough part. So. Uh, like like most places, whether it was Afghanistan or the U.S., if you have somebody that's successful that's doing it and shows the other people around, they want to know why they're successful. And that's the way you have to do that. You have to introduce it. You have to get somebody successful at it. And then other people have to see that and say, OK, what are they doing? How can I do that? And that's very, one of the ways that we're trying to point. introduce. This. Thank you for sharing that. When we return, we're going to conclude the conversation with our panel and answer any viewer questions that may have come in. Right now, we want to honor the career of a major general in this month's Shadow Box segment. This month's Shadow Box belongs to retired Army Major General Ronald Lowe. His work ethic took roots on his grandparents' Missouri farm. His family moved to California, where he attended San Jose State and joined the ROTC program. After graduation, he headed to Fort Benning, and within a year, he was a company commander. He served in Germany and as an advisor in Vietnam. 
Shortly after his discharge from the Army, he joined the Army Reserves, and after 25 years of distinguished service, he was promoted to the rank of Major General in 1993. After his civilian retirement in 2000, the Army placed him on active duty as a Chief of Staff for the U.S. Pacific Command in Hawaii. He now lives in Danville, California, and volunteers for the Sentinels of Freedom, the Vietnam Veterans of Diablo Valley, and the Veterans Memorial Building in Danville. We honor his service. We're talking about veterans and the environment. We welcome you to contact us with questions or comments. Call us at 925-313-1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One or email us at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. For those watching live tonight, we could really use your calls and emails to let us know who is tuning into the show. We're asked each the uh, guest tonight to uh, think about it a little bit and to uh, give us a, a comment on their most challenging uh, or significant event of their work uh, related to the environment. Uh, anyone want to go first? I can jump in there um, just because I, you know, the Nature Conservancy is a global conservation organization. And so when you show up at a rancher's door and you say, hey, I'm from the Nature Conservancy and I'm here to help. I mean, I've had a lot of doors get slammed in my face. Um, I think being able to think, you know, a little bit outside the box, when we think about the environment, a lot of times we, we close in on what we think is sort of the right audience to, to think about the environment. And we immediately go to things like people were saying on the earlier segment, recycle, solar, you know, those sorts of things. When in reality, there's a whole world out there that, um, you know, veterans can participate in. And I think that that's one of the great things that I love about the Nature Conservancy is we have a, we actually, as part of the Nature Conservancy, we have an employee resource group called uh, Veterans in Nature Service, where we actually are recruiting veterans to come work for the Nature Conservancy. And so if you're interested in, in learning more about that, um, just email vins at, um, at nature.org and um, would love to hear from veterans on how they can contribute into something that maybe you don't think is, is in your wheelhouse, but it probably is. We'll have resources listed at the end so uh, people awesome. will get a chance. Somebody else. Yeah, I'll, I'll go uh, real quick here. One of the things that I try to do is uh, when I go out and talk to people, not just veterans, but many of the farmers and ranchers that uh, we interact with, we talk to them about uh, some of the things we're doing at the Save Farm and try to convince them that uh, maybe they should come back and take some classes with us, both to help themselves learn some more modern techniques and to help our students understand where they're coming from, from their background. So we try to mix that, get that diversity up. But convincing folks that have been doing something for 60 years one way, to do it a different way is probably the biggest challenge we have. And I, I don't care whether it's in farming or whether it's with recycling or how you do do uh, food, stop food wastage. It's, it's convincing people uh, to take on different habits. And I think that's the biggest challenge we face everywhere in, in this fight. Thank you. Uh, Vince, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I... Uh... <laughs> That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, I think I would just go along is getting people to do things differently. I, I remember like, well, 1971, I, I just got out of the military. I've been out of the military and been doing a lot of reading. And I read this book, Silent Spring, which made me an environmentalist. It's kind of a seminal book in the environmental movement about the effects of pesticides. And I, I tried having conversations. I was working at a restaurant when going to college, and I'm trying to have conversations with people about the environment. And when I would say something, I would get quoted from the Bible about, you know, how we're, the earth is going to end and, you know, all this stuff. And I, I still find that a really challenging group to talk to, um, you know, about um, – it, where there is like the H.L. Mencken, Mencken quote from the Scopes trial years ago, 
for every problem there is a solution that is simple, neat, and wrong. And I think I think the big challenge is there's a lot of belief in those simple, neat, and wrong solutions, you know, in you know, in, around this issue. Um, so I think that's kind. Of, yeah, I would say that. Okay, uh, Silent Spring. That was Rachel Carson, wasn't it? Yes, Rachel Carson. I, I remember that book. Jake, uh, give us uh, what's significant uh, that you've been involved with in your career. Um, I would say, uh, I would say. The, the work in the forest that I do with the goats and um, removing the excess fuel uh, from an unmanaged forest um, has, has been super regenerative in my life. Um, but there's a challenge that we're all facing um, and it's funding. We, we don't have enough funding for this work. Um, and I see, uh, I see a shift happening. Uh, someone, someone mentioned a shift um, and I believe uh, the shift is happening to where we have to go from a uh, society that uses and uses and uses um, to and an economy um, that's that's completely focused on uh, individual profit to a society uh, that wants to survive um, and to do that we're going to have to uh, develop a regenerative economy um, and fund the the important work of hazardous fuels reduction and um, regenerative agriculture uh, and stream restoration, river restoration, all of these things, the biggest uh, challenge is, is there's not, there's not enough funding. Um, well, and, funding uh, probably is a, is a key issue. Uh, I'd like to just make a comment that this show for me is personally very interesting. Uh, we, we're located in, a, in an urban area in, in uh, Northern California, and generally most of our topics uh, have an urban bent. It's actually kind of refreshing to hear from people talking about agriculture, grazing, uh, regenerating forests, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember hearing a figure that uh, the food production in this country, I think involves 4% or fewer people, which is kind of amazing compared to uh, a couple hundred years ago where 95% of the population was needed just to survive. Uh, Jake also made a comment about funding. So I'd just like to throw it around the group real quick. Uh, what are sources of funding? The government obviously is a big one. Uh, what should be coming from the government and where should some of those funds be going? Anybody? Well, I, I mean, I think the government is definitely one source, but you're also seeing, um, obviously there's, there's a lot of uh, philanthrop philanthropic funding that, that flows through um, a lot of different organizations, and um, we're and we're, we're obviously recipients of some of that funding, and very grateful for that. But you're also seeing, you know, companies and um, whether it's um, different corporations or whether it's food companies or whomever that are really trying to invest in this space, especially in regenerative agriculture. How can they invest in their supply chain not only to um, make sure that they're meeting their climate goals or their environment goals that they have set, but also so that they can also um, ensure that the the uh, source of food that they're, whether it's cattle or crops or whatever the case may be, make sure that that's a resilient supply of um, inputs to their, to their businesses. And so you're seeing some funding coming from some of the companies as well, trying to invest in this space. I think one thing that we can do in terms of funding is 
it's changed how we spend our tax dollars. Um, this may not be a popular position with this group, but I'm going to say it anyway. The, the, mili- the money that we give to the military is outrageous. They, they get way more than I think is required for any kind of legitimate defense. Um, I think I think to fix this, we're going to need a bigger mobilization too, like 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 we did in World War II, a, a public-private partnership. Not only the you know not only shifting tax dollars around, but maybe increasing taxes on some corporations, um, people that have that currently and historically benefit um, from bad practices and have polluted. Um, and it, it's it's a big shift, but it's this is a huge issue. I think it's it's bigger than most people realize. Um, and I I think I don't know that we've got 50 years to fix it. I, I think I think it's shorter than that. I mean, I, I, I don't think that I think it's a shorter it's a short time frame that we have to shift things. And the only model I see is how the country responded in World War II. I mean, as you know, everybody, everybody pulling together, um, everybody figuring out something to do. Okay. Um, Thank you. And you, sir. It's uh, probably got to be a, a coalition, if you want to think of it that way. It, it's got to involve the government. It's got to involve the corporations. And, and uh, my son and I talk about this all the time. I'm very down on corporate uh, greed, if you will, where they're always looking only at short-term profits. And I think that uh, we need a change in corporate mentality to long-term profits and understanding how this impacts their long-term viability uh, to, to exist because there's too many corporations that don't understand that. There are some that do, and that's where we're getting some of this corporate funding to to say, okay, how can we do this in a more environmentally uh, healthy manner? But we also have to understand that there's got to be a balance because if we don't balance it right, uh, we're going to to get into the, the the issues that we always get when we go to bleeding edge solutions, where we can't implement the bleeding edge solution be because the way we're doing it is backwards. So for instance, with electric cars, what, what we didn't look at is we've got a lot of electric cars out there, but is there infrastructure to support it? When we don't have enough power generation to support the electric cars and the, the infrastructure we currently have. Now that means change on both sides. We need to reduce the amount of electricity we use on the infrastructure we currently have so that we can balance that to go to more electronic vehicles. But we're, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves with too many electric cars and not enough infrastructure. You know, it's the old logistics piece. What do you need to support what you need uh, as you implement it? And, and we've, we're backwards right now. So okay, that's well, that, but that, a couple uh, of good points. Uh, in preparing for this show, I was uh, interested to hear about the uh, project up in Washington that Jake's involved with. Uh, some people have said that uh, we used to have a draft and perhaps we should re-implement it, but give people an option of doing a, uh, a social project for a year or two where maybe you work in a civilian conservation core project. Uh, any thoughts on that? Vince, Nancy? So- I've got a thought on that. Um, I've got lots of thoughts on that. Um, we got about two minutes, so you can take a minute and we'll give somebody else the last minute. The, I, I wanna touch on the point that Vince made. We have an 800, over $800 billion a year military budget. Um, and I want to touch on the Civilian Conservation Corps um, in our history. We had a vibrant, civilian conservation court and it somehow morphed into the usda which is not a conservation corps Uh, (laughs) and my thought is restart the ccc 
and run it under the Department of Defense, where it has the funding, um, and provide some uh, homeland defense. This is this is climate action is uh, service in defense of this nation. Uh, Thank 100. you for that. I want to give the last minute to Nancy. What are your thoughts on a? a <laughs> well, I'm certainly not going to jump on the bandwagon that we should uh, cut the, the funding for the military. I'm sorry, I'm not on that bandwagon, but I do think that there are places that we can actually sort of help mobilize. Um, a lot of different uh, programs out there. I do think we need more people thinking about not only uh, serving, whether it's through volunteer work, but also through maybe it's maybe it's a career. You know, I certainly didn't think I was going to go from a counterintelligence agent to working for the Nature Conservancy. That wasn't in my career path, but I can tell you it's the most challenging thing I've ever done. It's also the most rewarding. So I just think we need people to be really passionate about the environment piece and and be able to serve in some capacity, whether it's through a career, through working for, you know, volunteering for a nonprofit or just getting involved somehow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, you've all been great tonight. This conversation has gone places I would not have anticipated. Appreciate everybody. Uh, differing views, but still a good conversation. So this concludes our discussion about veterans and the environment. A little later in the show, we'll have resources for veterans interested in getting involved. Right now, we want to share a very special memory. This is officially our 100th episode of Veterans Voices. First show is July 21 of 2014. Let's take a look at the first minutes of that first show with the creator of Veterans Voices, Nathan Johnson. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Veterans Voices a monthly talk show focusing on veterans' issues. This is the first pilot show produced here in CCTV's Studio Martinez. Now, Kevin, it, I think it's great that we have this opportunity. It's the first time we've had a show here in Contra Costa County in which we've been have, have the opportunity to talk about veterans. And uh, we've been talking about this now for a couple months. And what we hope to do here in this show is to reach the veterans, reach the family members, reach the community, right in their own living rooms. And that's great, Nathan, because we go to a lot of events and we, we reach veterans that kind of reach out to us, but sometimes uh, people don't get out, veterans don't get out, of the, get out to events. And so this gives us an opportunity to bring this show right home. This gives us an opportunity to discuss some of the benefits and resources that are available and to answer any questions. So uh, we want to continue to invite uh, callers to call in or, uh, or to chat with us so that we can answer questions that uh, directly relate to what, uh, what their interests are. Yeah, well, glad that we're here tonight. Glad our audience has joined us as well. Veterans Voices of Contra Costa is an outreach program uh, intended to provide opportunities for veterans to access resources from the VA and the community. Nathan Johnson was not only the host of Veterans Voices for eight years, he was the visionary that created this very special program and the heart and soul of the show. He produced 100 episodes of Veterans Voices, each one exploring a subject important to veterans with a depth and thoughtfulness that does not exist anywhere else in television. The mission of the show has not changed since the very first moments of that show, bringing information and resources into the living rooms of veterans and their families. We are proud to continue that mission as we embark on our next 100 episodes. We hope you have enjoyed our conversation about veterans and the environment. We leave you with some resources if you want to get involved. The Safe Farm teaches veterans to work with agriculture and the environment. Reach them at thesavefarm.org. The Nature Conservancy seeks to tackle climate change and provide food and water sustainability. Find out more at nature.org. The Washington Veteran Conservation Corps helps veterans adopt a new mission to help the environment. You can find them at ecology.wa.gov. Veterans for Peace Climate Crisis and Militarism Project is part of the worldwide movement to end the climate crisis and promote climate, environmental, racial, and economic justice. Find out more at veteransforpeace.org slash take dash action slash climate crisis. Veterans Voices is brought to you in part by contributions from the Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation, 
dedicated to helping veterans near you. American Legion Post 246, honoring the tradition of the American Legion in Danville. If you would like to help sponsor Veterans Voices, you can donate to Veterans Voices Care of Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation. Get in touch with them at DiabloVeterans.org. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa, so be sure to subscribe. Our next show will air on Monday, February 13th at 7 p.m. We will be celebrating Black History Month and you won't want to miss it. To all our veterans and their families, thank you for serving. To all of you who tuned in tonight, thanks for watching and have a great evening. Mm -hmm.